All right. Well, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, we'll dive right in. I think one of the things that we've you know, been thinking about is where where to show people the flexibility and power of using some of the tools that we've already talked about. Um, I think in a lot of the creative tooling for AI, what you see out in the market for AI solutions are basically just workflows that sit on top of these core capabilities that are available inside of tools like Invoke. Um, you know, people are using things like image to image to uh, control shape structure, just like they are with control nut combinations of both. Um, you know, you, you see a lot of uh, language around kind of like reimagining how to describe what's happening. So, you know, the denoising strength uh, slider in our tool, which is very uh, specific to what's happening technically, might be described as the creativity slider in a another uh, tool. And I think this is one of the areas where we're trying to make sure that you have the capabilities to create using the technology and create using new methods or applications of that technology, rather than just saying, you know, this is a uh, workflow to generate pictures of uh, interior design, and that's all you can do in our application. We're kind of much more broad uh, and allow for a lot of that kind of creativity in applying the solution to different professional workflows. And I think in a lot of ways, you can get into some really creative uh, outcomes by just playing around with the tools. I know a lot of people have done some really, really cool stuff with um, a variety of these, these functionalities. But today we're going to focus on this notion of kind of using shapes to guide the structure of our output. And I know that we've done, you know, some kind of element of this in the past with Blender and kind of showing the depth maps, but really you don't have to go to that degree of, uh, you know, high fidelity mocks of the, the concept that you have. You can just use shapes and kind of compose those in different ways to kind of create a silhouette, if you will, of what you're trying to look for. And this is a really good way to create kind of templates for different types of creative assets that you're trying to produce. You can think of this as kind of a very loose, um, you know, placeholder for where things ought to be in the composition of your image. You can use this for, um, you know, a variety of, of templating workflows, you might have like a, a silhouette, uh, let's say you're a, a game concept artist, and you have, uh, you know, heroes or champions that you have, uh, you know, kind of like rigs for, you can put those rigs as kind of like the base template that you then layer things on top of, right, you might have massive golem like uh, creatures, you might have small skinny creatures, and those effectively silhouettes uh, or shapes serve as um, kind of guidance and control to make sure that the AI doesn't go too far outside the lines. Now, the difference between this, something like this and uh, some of the workflows that we've shown in the past is we're not adding any detail at all, right? We're not going down to the depth of drawing in the shapes of things, um, you know, sketching out the full concept. That would be another control net workflow where you'd draw a sketch and you'd push that through and it would fill in the details of your sketch. This is kind of even more conceptual and kind of using just rough um, shapes to guide the generation process. We're just going to really use this as a tool to guide and shape the diffusion in such a way that we're uh, getting closer and closer to what we're looking for. Now, obviously, um, you know, you could do this directly on the canvas. I've got a couple of things that I've already um, created before. Um, another, you know, easy way to do this is just to go into a tool like, um, you know, Figma or Photoshop, do whatever structuring you want to do there and then pass it over. You can do different levels of shading if you want to, although most of that is going to be thrown away by the AI. The only thing that you would really benefit from if you want to see it is ensuring that when you do, um, you know, some of the designing or shape uh, composition, if you want there to be clear 
lines or delineation, making sure that if you know we pick a control net and kind of use that in the process, that it's picking those up, that you've created enough contrast for that. So we'll just get started. I know that we've got um, maybe like 50 minutes to get through a couple of these generations. And I do want this to be very interactive. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a little bit like a Rorschach test. Uh, I'm going to be looking for people to tell me what, what this shape is. And we're going to kind of use the various tools at our disposal to turn this shape into that uh, concept that people think it is. So we'll start with this one. Um, so we can, you know, I'll, I'll take some suggestions from folks of what they think this is or what I should generate here. Um, <laughs> uh, we're, we've got two suggestions and I think this is going to be a useful exercise to play around with it. Um, someone has suggested that this is a carrot uh, in the style of kind of like an animated uh, children's cartoon with a jetpack on. Um, and so, you know, we'll we'll give that a go. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use image to image. Um, I'll set that as my initial image and we're going to leave the denoising strength at 0.95. So I know some of this is gonna be repetitive. I won't go super, super in de detail again on the denoising strength, but I'll just kind of remind everybody when we have the denoising strength very high, all we're really getting is that a very initial kind of like uh, suggestion in the noise of what has content and what doesn't, what is white and what is a little bit kind of more of the structure that we're going for. So I'm going to leave that at 0.95. That'll be relatively high. I'm going to probably add a control nut and I'll do, we'll just do STXL soft edge and I'll bring that in and we'll see that you know, it really just kind of outlines this thing. Um, I'll set this to an image resolution of 1024 just so that I have it. I don't think that's really gonna change too much for this. Um, one call out here is if you are doing more kind of control net workflows where you are looking for lines and specifics, you're gonna wanna make sure that the image resolution is bumped up if you're using SDXL or anything larger than like a 512 by 512. Uh, but in this case, we'll, we'll kind of be okay. My goal here though, is not to use this to guide the entire generation because what will end up happening is it won't add any detail into the middle, right? So if you, again, think about the begin to end step as the life cycle of the denoising process, the early half of that is structure and the last half of detail. So if we are telling it that this is in that detail section of the denoising strength, it's gonna think there is no detail in the middle. So I'm, I'm going to drop this down to, you know, 20%. I'm really using just, just for the initial structure so that when we're generating, it's keeping to this shape. Um, but then we're going to kind of open it up and let it get kind of crazy for that last 80%. Um, so we'll do both of our uh, suggestions here. One was the carrot in the style of the uh, children's animated series, and then in, an interplanetary transport ship. Um, so this is kind of like a sci-fi vehicle. Um, both of these are vehicles. One is just a little bit sillier than the other. So we'll say uh, a carrot, um, a character uh, in the style of a children's 3D animated series. Uh, we'll go with, well, I'll throw in Unreal Engine. Why not? We all love Unreal Engine for the, the quality. It might be too, too good. Um, but we'll, we'll throw that in for now. Um, and we'll do something like, um, white background. Maybe we'll add some, why not? Okay. Uh, we're going to give that a go. This is going to be fun. Oh, you know what I forgot? No jetpack. <laughs> Somebody reminded me. Somebody reminded me said they no, no jetpack. That is uh, that is true. We do not have a jetpack. So it is going to be confused by this. Um, wearing a jetpack. Uh, but hey, you know, I will say that's a pretty good carrot. You know, I think this this carrot, mm, we'll take it. We'll take it. There's some weird carrot carrots on the side, but 
Um, we do, <laughs> yeah, I like them too. Um, you, you all can give them a name if you want to. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and try with a jetpack though and see if we can get that to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more along the lines of what we were shooting for. Um, It's kind of, kind of like an orange jetpack here. It's kind of, well, it's, yeah, it's like an orange jetpack. It looks pretty good. We've got kind of this like orange, orangish shape on the sides. Um, I can imagine us um, trying to fight this. There's like two ways we could go about it. We can really try to get it to from our prompt get the color in um one one concept that has come up recently is this notion of adjective bleed i've seen a lot of this in the discord and adjective bleed is when you have things in these ai models that have color i think a lot of people feel like they're um they've learned from things like chat gpt that they should treat this like a chat bot and you're kind of talking to it in a very like conversational way. I think most of the image generation models are not like chatbots. They don't interpret things the same way. It's almost the, the way to think about them is at least the current state. There's some new models out that will probably change this, but the current state is you're kind of putting a bunch of words in this word soup, stirring it up. And it's kind of like turning into this blend of all these words. And then it's, you know, getting thrown out into the uh, output. The sometimes it, it is able to kind of parse out and keep things separate. But a lot of times if I say like, you know, green jetpack here, it might make the whole thing green because green just kind of gets applied everywhere. There's like tricks for, for addressing that, but um, we'll say a, a black carbon steel jetpack. And then we'll see how, how this turns out. Sometimes it's fine if it's got enough like distinction, like a carrot is typically always orange. Uh, but we might find that it becomes a carbon steel carrot. So this is like a good example of that, right? So now we've got this like carbon steel monstrosity that has just um, a carrot, carrot mothership that fights off rabbits. Yeah, so now we've got this kind of like carrot in the middle that has taken on this carbon steel jetpack, right? Um, so there's, you know, there's definitely like tricks here to this. If I were to say like, I really liked um, this, what I could do is go into um, go into the canvas and just pick, you know, my jet black color. And I could even go so far as to say, just like, you know, paint the whole area here uh, black, right? I'm just gonna do that. And then uh, kind of reimagine this uh, area. We'll see what we get with 0.95. The, the benefit here is we've got this shape controlling everything. So we're able to do really, really high denoising strength, even though, you know, typically you would find this to be too much. Um, kind of turn that into a leaf. <laughs> Although I do think we've got a little bit of the jetpack on the side. Uh, so again, because we're, we're at a very high denoising strength here, um, it is primarily taking just structure we could tone this down so we're the, getting a little bit more of that color. And although this is pretty, this is pretty cute. I like this, right? Um, you know, I'll, just for fun, I'll save that to my gallery so we can save that for later. Um, but I'll discard that and then I'll drop down the denoising strength. Maybe we'll go to 0.8 um, and give give that another go. Um, and I know that this is uh, definitely not our. Inter interstellar transport ship yet, but we'll get there. So 0.8 is too low. Try, a, I'm just gonna cancel that because I can already see it kind of looks more like wings. So get up to 0.87, kind of a happy medium, the Goldilocks there, uh, and we'll give that a go. Okay, this is, you know, I'm creating some like jet, jet like arms and more like an airplane. But I think you get the idea, you know, we're, we're kind of playing around with different strengths to find that repeatable process that we can use to uh, compose this. So, yeah, this is like well, a little bit more like uh, some strange 
airplane wings, uh, but we could probably you know pass this through again, uh, get closer to closer to what this might be with a jetpack. I don't really know what this would look like with a jetpack, anyways. Uh, it'd probably be more like wings with jets is kind of more of what I would have to imagine for this shape. Uh, but I think we get the idea here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back and do a our secondary one, which is an interplanetary transport ship. And for the sake of this, I am going to just take out our subject here. Interplanetary transport ship, um, award-winning sci-fi video game uh, design, Unreal Engine, dynamic lighting, blah, 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 blah. Okay. We're going to keep that all the same. And we'll turn this guy back up to 0.95. And we'll go ahead and invoke. Uh, and what we're doing is using our shape and getting something completely different. But again, we're kind of controlling it with this, this very strong suggestion of what this outline is. And now we've got um, kind of like the output that's being controlled by that shape. And this is, I mean, this is cool because we can kind of think about things in silhouettes rather than having to focus details. We can really get down into more of like, what's the shape and structure that I've got in my mind. Um, without having to do a lot of the very specific detailing. And then, you know, we've got the shape and the structure and we can really just roll through different concepts for that shape and that structure. We can think about, you know, like what are, what are ideas that I want to throw out there that will help turn this shape into something else. And as you start to see what's coming out, um, you know, you can use things like IP adapter if you want to use a reference image. You know, you can say like, this is a really cool... Um, idea that uh, exists out there in the world and I want to kind of like shape that idea into this um, shape, right, with our controls. Um, you've got a lot of ways to influence your prompt and get cool ideas on the other side. Um, so in this case, we've got, you know, some really cool, um, really cool ideas. Um, let's see here. we got a couple questions coming in. Uh, for the carrot, could it work with uh, wearing a black jet pack in parentheses to separate the subjects? Parentheses aren't going to do anything other than be used for upweighting or downweighting a group of prompt terms. Those, are not, those aren't going to separate. You can do prompt breaks, which are a little bit more complicated of a prompt syntax. Uh, effectively, what you do is uh, prompt one and prompt two in, uh, in quotations and put those inside of parentheses with an and at the end. That syntax is a little bit hard to parse. Um, and I, I think we've probably got some like uh, plans to make updates to that in the future so that it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, but effectively what that does is if you think about, we'll use the soup analogy again, because I think it's a, it's maybe I'm just showing that I didn't eat lunch. Um, but you know, if you think about throwing all the words into one thing of soup, using the and prompt syntax is like creating two different uh, bowls of soup that each have their own ingredients and then putting them together into the resulting dinner. I, you know, you get, you get the idea. It's kind of, it's less of um, we cooked it all together and more like we mixed it in at the end. Um, can you write the syntax out in chat? I can. Um, the syntax, maybe I'll put it in here so that we can see. Um, we'll give we'll give this one a shot. Um, so interplanetary transport ship, blah, 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 blah. So I'm putting all of that prompt inside of quotes. Uh, and I, I, I will put an asterisk here for anyone watching this far in the future. Um, this prompt syntax is probably going to change to be just a little easier to use. Um, or you can think about this, doing this in like a workflow. Um, but we'll, we'll do this for now anyways. Um, what's something that we can add into this? We'll just say like red stripes. And then you finish that off with a dot and open close parentheses. It's it looks like a little like, you know, code like in some sense. Um, but again, this is one of those areas where um, you have you have some controls that are being controlled via text right now that I think in the future we will uh, build some supportive inter interfaces for. Um, so we'll give this a shot. 
uh, and see what we get here. Um, but what this does, it is essentially is like keeping these prompts a little bit separated. Um, although we seem to have ended up with some, like a lot of it anyways, although I think this is probably like pretty, pretty close. Um, it's like fit, it fits pretty well. I think we still ended up with what we have. I mean, we, we might, the challenge here is we don't really have anything that we've got competing with it on um the left hand side so you know we could say like a blue uh interplanetary transport ship where do I, and then we can do um i don't know red wings and see if we can get that to uh interpret that again this is this is a problem that is being addressed at the model level right now we have these kind of like older um older models that don't really handle prompt adherence super well and we've got these like tricks like using this that sometimes work, um, but overall you're still fighting with this kind of like poor prompt adherence underneath in the model. That is actually, there's like uh, models that are coming out in the coming weeks that should address some of those things. Um, in this case, you know, we don't really have red wings, but we can try, you know, increasing the weight of red and hope that, you know, we'll fight, we'll fight for that. This is why a lot of times I end up going to the canvas to really just kind of like instruct where I'm thinking the red is anyways, because controlling via controlling things like details in prompts is never going to be exactly what you have in mind. It's not the same, right? So if I were to actually want to do this um, and get some of that color, I would come in, you know, pick the ideas that I've got. So maybe I'm thinking like, um, red stripes right there and on the tips of the wings right so i've got like my mental model of what this looks like and what i'm going to do is just kind of you know select those areas pull my uh, denoising strength down and give that a go and that's this is like I, why I always end up going to the campus anyways, because it's never going to have exactly what I was thinking in, in my mind. But if you do it a little bit more manually, you can get a lot of that control and the detailing. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? You're just kind of like showing it where you want that red. You know, what, what exactly were you thinking when you said red wings or red tipped wings or whatever? And so now we've got a lot more kind of control in the color space of what that's going to end up looking like. Um, so you can kind of detail that out. Um, someone asks, is this, uh, an issue with occlusion where the model can't quite see what we're imagining because it's not the full shape and occluded by the shape of the carrot. So we're going back to the carrot. We really like that carrot. I think somebody named him, um, friendly little guy. Uh, I'm imagining if we just had the triangle shape and did a jet pack, it would give us something out of sky captain or rocketeer. Um, so is this because the model can't quite see what we're imagining because it's not the full shape? Pro probably. Yeah, I mean, probably it, it's having to guess at those details and it doesn't really know. So I, I think it probably is a matter of, I mean, the one thing that you have to, to think about is as, as humans, and this is why the creative is always going to be in the driver's seat with AI. It's, it's, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people who look at this stuff and they're like, Oh my God, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. But you know, when you look at this shape and you get something crazy, like, you know, this is a carrot, um, this is a, <laughs> this is a carrot with a, a jetpack on it. You know, you're, you're kind of imagining much better what, how, how that would have to be, uh, structured in order for that to be true like you're, you're kind of you're able to do that much better because we as humans have the ability to construct new things right and what ai models are doing is they're taking what has been done before and trying to fit it almost mathematically to the shapes that they're seeing so if they've never seen anything like uh, a carrot with a jetpack it's really going to struggle to figure out where which part of this would be the carrot, which part would be the jetpack. And you know, it, it doesn't do like a terrible job. Like this isn't awful, but it probably isn't what 
you would have in mind because you know a little bit more about like what type of of elements or details would be on that jetpack. So you can imagine even going in and adding in some details and kind of showing the shape of this a little bit more. I mean, this goes back to if you are if you have that idea in your head and you know where certain things are, sketching it in is super useful, right? You can sketch it in and you can put it in a control net and it will look at your sketch and try to map these concepts into the sketch that you've drawn. It's going to accelerate your workflow. Um, the the kind of shapes that we're suggesting here are going to be useful for contexts that are similar to what it's seen in the past or ideas that, that have existed before. Um, and in this case, I think there's a big difference between like a space fighter and a carrot with a jetpack on it, right? So we've got these like very strong um, stylistic differences, but it looks a little bit more natural when it fits kind of the shape of things that it uh, kind of makes sense for that shape. Like the, these space fighters all make sense, right? Um, and we can kind of imagine that. Now, if we were to want to give this a lot more control uh, or, or freedom, I should say, you know, we can decrease the control pretty significantly and we can end up, um, and I'll just take the, um, just the original prompt here. Um, and this is going to be high denoising strength, really low control, and it's going to have more flexibility with the shape that we're giving it. So we have some levers that we can pull to say more like this shape, or this is just kind of like a suggestion. You can kind of get a little creative here, and that's all dependent on how much control you're imposing on that early structure. Um, yeah, somebody somebody called out the jetpacks don't typically have wings, and that's kind of what, what's throwing it off. It's a great call out because in my mind, I'm creating the wings and I'm like, okay, well, I see wings there in my mind and like my Rorschach test, I'm, I see wings. And so for me, any type of carrot with a jetpack would have to have wings on it, but it's not in the prompt. And so it's not really thinking about it that way. It's kind of like, what, how is this all a jetpack, right? Um, and that's, that's gonna be um, a pretty common pattern. So now that we've decreased the tightness of our shape here, we're getting a lot of like different variations on the space fighter, right? We've got a lot of, um, it's not all structured the same. We've got more variations and kind of more patterns that are starting to emerge. And we can take these and iterate on them, right? We can say, oh, you know what? I like that, but I really want something else. You know, I want, I want to kind of add in some laser um, guns on the side and have kind of like some things there. You can kind of like start to add in new concepts um, and layer those into this. Um, Someone said, if you like one of these and wanted to move forward with it, how might you generate different angles of that design? Um, that's going to be a, a creative challenge, right? What I would suggest if you were going to do that type of workflow, and I probably won't do it here because I think we'd probably spend the next 30 minutes just getting, getting that uh, shape outlined. What I would do is if you find a concept here that is you know particularly interesting, you would probably go in and create a second shape, a companion shape for this thing at a different angle. And then you could use this as an IP adapter, right? So you would want to go in and do some of that structuring of like, how, how might this look in a different angle? How might this um, appear from the side, um, you know, from the front? And then you can kind of like use IP adapter to do that. What's really fun is there are some technologies that are on the way, I would say, probably in the next, if I had to be very, um, very pessimistic, I would say six months to a year where you can pass in an image and say, give me a 3D uh, output of this. That's, that's good. Now we have the technology today. There's already models that do that where you can pass an image in and it creates like a, an approximation of the 3D mesh. It's not great yet. Um, it's not perfect, but we're getting pretty close in, um, e in even an open source to being able to do that. And I think that's where you're going to have um, some interesting tools in your toolkit to say, here's a concept, flip it around in different angles, 
Uh, and then once you get to one of those angles, you can then kind of augment that and uh, play around with that like shape and what it's assumed and all that kind of stuff. I think I think we're close to being able to do those types of workflows. Um, I mean, if, you, if anyone has seen Sora, uh, the, the OpenAI video model, I'm sure everyone is starting to, to recalibrate their expectations for how quick this stuff is moving. It is moving very fast. And so now that we have this, um, this technology that can kind of imagine things from different angles, I think we're gonna see workflows like that that are a lot easier than uh, what I just proposed uh, start to come down the pipe real soon. But for now, I would just um, can candidly, you know, approximate the shape using um, kind of a sketch or doing something else, um, kind of like the silhouette that we've done here, and then just using kind of prompts to pull that out. Um, I think that's that's kind of where um, my suggestion would be on the image side. Um, your ships look awesome. Thank you. Uh, is that coming to invoke in the next six months to year? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to be really mindful of is um, how people are innovating and where the research is happening. Um, I would say it's it's something that we're keeping a really close eye on and looking to ensure that we have kind of access to. The challenge will be if that is open source research or something that is um, kind of kept proprietary. If that's proprietary, there's likely no way that we'd be able to put that in the open source product. Um, we we probably look to offer that in the you know professional uh, services that we provide to enterprises and primarily because we'd probably have to like license that technology or um, partner with, with whoever is uh, producing it. Um, but if it is open source, then, uh, you know, we'd be integrating that into the open source product. So it's, it's kind of like one of those things um, where the innovation happens matters. If it's open source, it's accessible. People will be able to use it. If it's put behind a restrictive license or put behind um, something that doesn't even, you know, there is no open code at all or open model. Uh, those things just, you know, will be a little bit more locked up. Um, do you know if they're using depth and point clouds for the new image to 3D stuff? I think the way to think about where innovation is happening right now is people are innovating on a few different dimensions. There's workflows like using depth and then, you know, imagining or having the AI imagine kind of what might be around the corner. Um, but if you look at what is happening, I mean, I think Sora is a good example. Um, Sora has the ability to generate kind of this like simulated world, right? It's got, almost got, it's like in, implicitly learned simulated physics. It learns kind of like what is in the world that it has created and how those things would typically like operate in that world. And you can, you can see that in the videos that come out of Sora, you can see that there is like this, there's interactions between objects. There's kind of like this, this sense of this is like a moving living world and there's object permanence, like an object can move behind another object. And that's not because Sora is doing some kind of like magic layering, right? It's not creating this video, creating layers and composing that. It is effectively just controlling that through its generation process. It's creating this kind of like, if, if there is an object here, this is what would need to be true in the physics of this world. And what that means is in some sense, it's able to imagine, if we wanna anthropomorphize a little bit, it's dangerous to do that. Uh, it's, it's able to imagine that thing in 3D, right? And that, that is what a lot of these uh, image to 3D models are doing is it's taking the image and it has learned this relationship between the image that is passed in and kind of like what that typically looks like on the other side, if it's a character, if it's a vehicle. Um, I saw a really impressive um, kind of like phaser gun uh, that uh, one of these companies had done. And it you could kind of like, you could see on the front that there was a hole, you could spin it around, you could kind of see through it. There was like, it's like really incredible, right? I think the thing that you, probably want to be thinking about as a professional creative though, is in this world where all of that stuff is happening, it is still very important that you're guiding it. And if you are going to be guiding it, which, which dimension and what lo level of tooling are you going to be interacting with that on? Are you going to be 
getting a 3D model and having to go in and fight that? Or are you going to be able to say, oh, kind of like that, but take this in in two dimensions, right? And, and, and I think the two-dimensional landscape is where we're going to see a lot of these tools um, use kind of human input as guidance, as you'll be able to provide it like uh, instruction using like 2D interfaces like Invoke, and you'll be able to pass that into the model and kind of take it from there. A lot of a lot of the video generation, especially in like filmmaking, if you talk to uh, people who are making movies, what they're doing is they're composing keyframes for their stories in tools like Invoke, in tools like Midjourney, and they are then using the video models that are out there. Um, that might be like you know a a runway, a Pika, stable video diffusion, they're passing in that composed frame to, to kind of like serve as a storyboard, if you will, and the AI model is finishing that out. So that's kind of like, you know, one area of um, interesting creativity. So we'll take uh, another set of inputs. I'm, you know, this shape kind of looks a little bit like a spaceship to me. Uh, I'm kind of hesitant to uh, do another spaceship since I know we've got like 20 minutes. So maybe we'll take uh, this this thing and ask people what it is. I think it's probably maybe a little bit too on the nose of what I was like thinking about in my head, but we'll, we'll let the audience decide what this is um, and maybe take it from there. Turtle with a slipper as a shell. Okay. Uh, that's definitely a creative interpretation of this. We can give that a shot. A goldfish on wheels. Uh, there's some real creativity happening here. Um, Pinewood Derby car. Okay, that one's probably the most likely. Okay, because we did this for the last one, we'll do it for this one. Uh, we'll do one of these kind of like off the wall suggestions and try to figure out how to get that to where this shape fits that. Um, and then we'll do the Pinewood Derby car and we'll kind of uh, leave it at that. So if this is going to be a turtle with a slipper as a shell, I, I don't know. I don't honestly know what, how this would be interpreted as that, but we're going to let it, we're going to let it go. Um, I probably don't want too tight control because it will get a little bit too hairy uh, and maybe struggle with this because I know I would, I would struggle quite a bit. Um, and we will do a turtle with... I don't even. Here we go. Uh, audience engagement is always a risk. That's what they say in the live biz. But, you know, turtle with a slipper is a shell. <laughs> well, you know, it did. A pretty good job as, of creating the turtle. I don't think the slipper as a shell really came through, but it did, you know, it did a pretty decent job of turning that into a turtle. Um, let's go to our images here. Um, yeah, I mean, it does have like it's got like a, a layer. The AI is never wrong. This is this is right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take that. <laughs> Just gonna accept that. I don't know what. I don't even know what a slipper as a shell would be. Like, I, I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, and if I don't know what it is, I think the AI is probably going to struggle quite a, quite a bit. Um, so we'll change this to a Pinewood Derby car. Uh, we'll go sanded wood. Uh, I'm familiar with Pinewood Derby cars. We'll turn that strength up a little bit because we really want it to have that uh, kind of shape control and we'll generate. <laughs> Somebody said, should do this as a regular contest on Discord, set a shape and see people, what people come up with. Not a bad idea. So this is uh, Pinewood Derby car, sanded wood. And I think that looks pretty good. I mean, uh, it definitely created some new like uh, structure up here with um, if you would look at the shape, it had to like reinterpret how this all gets fit in. But candidly, I think it did a pretty good job. Um, I think, well, you know, one thing that we could do, and this kind of goes back to playing around with the shapes, 
Um, we can go to our canvas and we'll take this shape out. And, you know, we can always edit our shape. Uh, and in this case, I'll just, you know, take some white and, you know, kind of take a bite out of the back here. Uh, so, you know, we've got a little bit more of a streamlined shape of the car and, you know, save that out. And then we can use that as our initial image and as our control input. Back looks a little bit, a little bit wobbly, but we'll take it. Uh, and now we've kind of, you know, we'll get a different shape here. So we're getting some decent, some decent Pinewood Derby cars. Um, obviously this like window is a little bit weird, but you've got, you got some decent kind of shapes coming through. Now, if we wanted to, um, you know, we can kind of see what this would look like in our, um, alternative world where this isn't a Pinewood Derby car, but it's a interstellar, uh, sci-fi, uh, space vehicle with jets. See it. We'll see what it comes up with. We're kind of like throw, we're throwing a curveball at it, trying to see what it what it generates here. This is part of the fun, though. You know, seeing seeing kind of uh, conceptually what it can come up with. Um, and we definitely gave it a lot of freedom there. Um, or it ha it forced it forced its way a little bit to kind of like reimagine how this would fit in this uh, this thing. So obviously, it kind of created this. I mean, technically it kind of fits the shape. It just had to create a couple of different um, elements to make that fit. And I think this is, again, another uh, beautiful thing about this is we're passing in a silhouette. We're not really passing in the lines. And so it is kind of filling in a lot of those things uh, itself, which is, is kind of cool to see because it can give you some interesting ideas. Um, yeah, this one's obviously taken taken the shape and reimagined it kind of going in a different direction. So there's some, there's some like cool ideas here that are popping out. Um, this one is actually really cool. Uh, it's a really cool shape. So this is interesting. Let's, you know, let's think about it this way. Uh, we do still have some time left. Um, somebody said introducing shapes feels like a great way to produce images that don't feel too generic. I think it's a great point. You know, I think one thing that you'll find if you if you're in this space long enough, you know how to pick out AI generated images most of the time, because most people do not try very hard to create something novel in AI. They are just generating images, right? They put in a prompt, they get images out. Um, they're kind of coming up with some cool ideas, but they're not really thinking about how do I make this different? How do I make this unique? How do I really create with this as a tool? Um, using control adapters, using image to image, that can give you some really interesting compositional tools to really push the images into something that that's maybe more interesting, has more of your creative input there. Uh, so using shapes, using kind of like the structure of uh controls helps you really s turn this into something that looks a little bit more um interesting composed intentional um it's not just another person standing in the middle of the picture right because i think you can start to see this pattern where if you don't really do these any techniques to make something kind of go outside the lowest common denominator ai generated image uh, if you don't inject any of your creativity you can tell, right? You can look at the image and say, this is just one of those other uh, billion AI generated images. It's just, it feels the same. Whereas this, you know, this interesting shape that we've kind of injected here has created this like dynamic. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to try something out. We've kind of got this like image here. That's interesting. Uh, we're just going to give this a going to give this a go. We're going to inject this as our IP adapter, 
and put this as like, you know, 0.5 or so. I'll leave this as pretty high control. I didn't mean to change that as the initial image. I'll leave that there. So we're forcing the shape. We're keeping the prompt the same as we used to generate this kind of spaceship. But now we're kind of jamming these two together and we're kind of forcing it to do um, something new. Uh, trying to trying to push it towards this image that we generated over here. So we'll give that a go. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that works. Could be. Could be good. Maybe. We might see some similar concepts. We might need to push this up a little bit. Um, Okay, I could imagine this being the front and this being the back, right? I can like squint and see that. Um, bump this up to see if that drives anything forward. But you can see that this like helps give some similarity to this. One thing that's interesting with these types of workflows is if you've got like, if you're, if you're making something that has uh, themes or like factions, like video games is something I always come back to. I think that's probably because I'm a gamer. Um, if you've got themes or factions, you can use image prompting to kind of like inject that faction or that thing into the generations, right? And so if you've got different shapes, you can kind of test out like, I'll inject an IP adapter of faction A and try it on a bunch of different shapes and see what happens uh, when you go through that process. You can kind of generate a lot of cool ideas that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can see, I can see some semblance of this working out. Um, I think what was ended up happening here is that it's, it's, um, interpreting this as the bottom rather than this as the top, almost in all of these, which makes sense. Um, we, we won't cover this on this video, but kind of, a maybe sneak peek at some things that are coming up. Um, for those of you who are not aware, Invoke has a training repo. Uh, you can train your own AI model using that UI. Um, you can train Laura's, you can do Dream Booth, uh, you can do Pivotal Tuning. Pivotal Tuning is interesting. In a video that we're going to do in the next week or so, we'll walk through what what is an embedding, what is a Laura, and how do those like how can you use those as tools? How do you train something, and like how do you get that that control? And in the reason I'm kind of calling that out is when you're creating it, something like an embedding, you're creating a new control word, right? You're teaching a new word uh, to the system to kind of like invoke what you're thinking about. And in this case, if I wanted to very clearly structure, like this is a top down uh, of a spaceship and the top is up here and the bottom's down here. This is like, we'll call it like um, top top view, uh, spaceship top view. That's like my embedding. Well, then you're kind of like able to inject that type of control in your prompts. And so like embeddings become a very powerful tool in your toolkit of controlling uh, using words. And, you know, prompts are useful for that. But if there's a, a thing that you know but it doesn't, you don't know how to describe it in words that it will understand. That is what embeddings are, is you're kind of like consolidating uh, the meaning of something and creating kind of a new language or a code word that you're able to use. That's really what an embedding is um, from a functional perspective. And so that becomes a really powerful tool in creating workflows for your business because you can you know, like control the words and do things uh, that are very specific to uh, your pipeline and your creative workflow. Um, somebody asked, let's see, uh, I often get better results with futuristic rather than sci-fi. Fair. Uh, the shape control adapter might be restricting SD's ability to match the outline of our IP adapter. In this case, we're not doing a plus IP adapter. We're doing the base IP adapter, which is much more conceptual and not as much trying to um, map the shape. 
I do think that there's probably some bleed of the concept here, which is like looking at it a specific direction and kind of like injecting that into the image. So I, there, there probably is a little bit of like battling between the shape control and the IP adapter, but um, we're not using plus. If we used plus, it probably would be pretty weird. Um, I'll just do it to show you. Trust me, it's probably gonna be weird. Um, we'll generate one with this. And the reason why is because what plus does is it's gonna be like looking at the shape and the positioning as well. And then we've got this like soft edge control adapter. And so it's gonna be like where in space is our certain concepts, where is like this in space, and not like space space, but like in the image compositionally. And so it's gonna like have both, right? So it's trying to do this kind of like this concept of a, a porthole, a window, whatever this is. It's like that's in the middle of the screen. And so we need to have something like that in the middle of this ship. Now, it does look pretty cool. I don't know that that's where I'd put that uh, on a ship, but it still looks cool. Um, and we could probably play around with it and have some fun um, with this idea. It's like an interesting concept, but uh, it certainly is a little bit different than um, when we are just kind of injecting it lightly as a concept and it has more shape control. Um, that plus is going to really like define a lot of that. Somebody asked, when is training coming out as part of Invoke? Uh, there's not, the training is going to be a separate uh, app always. So we don't want to force people who don't have the hardware to train or the desire to train to have a training app inside of Invoke. It's going to be a separate app always, but it is already available. You can download, install it, it already is easy to install. Um, it's not, it doesn't have a one click installer like Invoke, but I think it only takes two or three steps to get it installed. Um, the instructions are relatively straightforward in the installation document. And uh, using it does take a little bit of like know how, and that's kind of why we're going to go through it on a video. Um, but you will, we'll cover that and kind of share how to get started with training, how you can play around with it, how you can learn uh, the benefits there. Um, if we feed the new ship and its silhouette, can we get the other side? Um, I think that was kind of like the, the question that came up earlier. We can try, but I don't think that we're going to probably find that it does that. You know, we can, we can see if we, we can, um, to think of how we do this i honestly if i was going to do that i'd probably just turn this into a depth control net rather than the silhouette uh we'll do this and it's going to be kind of tough to get that um to flip around though so do we think that this is the front or the back probably the back so you know the front of an interstellar sci-fi space vehicle with jets. Uh, we'll just come out here to text to image. Um, and this will create, um, I, I anticipate that this is gonna create something very similar to what we already have. Uh, I mean, use the new image as a control so that it fits the shape. Right, so that's what we just did here, right? We used it as a control um, rather than just using it in soft edge because it's not just a silhouette, it is like a full image. Um, it's got like details and stuff. Yeah, see, this is a little, little bit funky. Uh, we could probably turn that down a little bit. Um, I'll turn this up to 1024 as well. But I think, yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit funky trying to fight fight that. Um, plus, this shape is kind of funky. Like we're looking at this depth, this depth map is kind of funky. Um, might turn that down a little bit. So we're not really trying to get a lot of that like deep depth. We're really just trying to get like the uh, the shape uh, in space. But yeah, it's, you know, see, it's, 
the experimentation is part of the fun, but yeah, it's if you try to jam too much in here, you can get some really weird stuff, right? Because we're not putting guardrails on this. It's um, it's really kind of as as malleable as you want. I, I mean, I would say that this isn't too bad, but there's definitely some weird stuff to it. You'd want to like fix um, in this case. But overall, I think the the idea here. Uh, the the main use case is not going to be rotating again. I think that's something that's a little bit of a ways out. Um, you know, we've talked with some customers of ours that have asked about that capability, and really, you know, you can imagine uh, a couple of reasons why. If you come up with a really cool car concept, right, you want to see it in a different angle. Uh, if you come up with a cool character, you want to see them in a different angle. Um, you know, there's especially when you're doing concept art for uh, video games, you've got like orthos, which are basically kind of like the, uh, I'm like a, a mannequin, if you will, of this character. And it's used in the modeling process and being able to just kind of like repose characters very easily is, is definitely something that's um, interesting uh, problem space. But Overall, I think we're not quite there yet. We'll probably see some movement in the next few months on that type of, of workflow. Um, cool. Well, I will. Uh, I think we've got only a minute or two left. I'll answer any last questions that people have, and then we'll call it for the studio session today. Thank everybody for joining. Uh, as as I'm waiting for questions to come in, I'm going to go in and pick out my favorite. Uh, I think this will like one of my favorite ships. I'll just star that one. Um, like this red ship. Got some cool turtles. I got probably partial to the spaceships myself. Um, yeah, this one's pretty cool too. Yeah, there we go. Got some cool spaceships there. Sweet. All right, we got some more questions. Any info on 4.0? It's coming soon. Uh, what is planned in it? Uh, there is going to be a, this is more of like a technical, um, architecture update for the application to manage models better. Um, benefits that you'll probably see inside of it are going to be things like, um, better model metadata. We'll actually have the infrastructure to support model defaults. So if you want uh, default values for VAEs, for steps, for schedulers, rather than having to save that off in a notepad, you'll be able to save that on the model defaults and have that update every time you switch to it. It'll be like an optional thing. Um, we've got some other model enhancements there as well. Um, and there'll be some other like nice little uh, tips, tricks, and enhancements that come with uh, 4.0 to help make things easier. Uh, it's a pretty like major architectural change and that's why it's the 4.0 bump because there is some breaking changes in there from a model perspective um from a, like if you built on top of our application um, but as a user it's mostly just going to be a lot of really nice quality of life enhancements and setting the stage for future model architectures to be injected into the app we're starting to see more and more models come out um, and with that, we just need better infrastructure to support more models and capabilities there because we do a lot of model management and that's effectively what 4.0 is. Um, I think that was the only question that came in. Uh, so we'll leave it at that and thank everybody for coming. We'll see you next time.